In this third passage, we are telling Mark Hughes, sorry, man, but you're wrong. The um, whole point is that there's this Marcusean idea about advertising that says that it creates these false needs and we are compelled to uh, fulfill them by buying products. And this author is saying, but in line 35, in fact, Marcusians make a major mistake in assuming that we're not acting autonomously. We consumers do have free will and are able to make choices and we're not just compelled to buy. And that is how we describe what we've read. Question 16, the main point of the passage, Marcusians are wrong, we are not compelled, we are autonomous. Answer choice C, Marcusian arguments are mistaken because individuals are able to make autonomous decisions. Boom, boom, done. For 17, something the author said about Marcuse. Um, and the second paragraph, Marcuse supposed that we all have certain real needs and advertising appropriates those needs. B, advertisers appeal to people's real needs in order to create false needs. Put your fingers on the place in the passage and say, yep, this is where the author tells us that Marcuse believed it. The main purpose of the first paragraph in 18 is um, very similar to lots of what we've seen before. We summarize the position that we are about to refute. Isn't that the same thing we saw in the first passage in this section? I believe it was. Memory might fail me. Um, but certainly that's what happens here. The first paragraph exists in order to tell us what Marcusians believe so that in the next paragraph and those after we can show why that's not really the case. Uh, e, to describe Marcusian views regarding mass market manipulation, yeah, and to indicate their role in certain criticisms, yeah, how Marcuse came to dominate some critical thinking. And we do that in order that we can then later uh, rail against it. 19, again, as with 17, something that the author says Marcuse believes. I'm in line 7. Marcuse maintained that modern people succumb to oppression by believing themselves satisfied in spite of the fact that they're not. A, in modern society, advertising helps lead people to think they are satisfied. For question 20, what are these forces of persuasion? Look at the context here. I'm in line 30. Uh, if Marcusians are right, we can't separate our real needs from the alleged false needs. In order to do so, be necessary to eliminate forces of persuasion. Where are the forces of persuasion? The invisible creation of false needs by advertisers. And I say invisible because according to Marcusians, we can't control them. We don't even know what's happening. We're just being, our, we're puppets and our strings are being pulled. Um, e, manipulative influences. Yes, the work of advertisers that some theorists say go unrecognized by those affected. Marcusian theorists say that we don't know we're being manipulated. That's what those forces are, the false needs created by advertisers. Um, I felt like there was something else I was going to say about it, but I don't think there really is. In 21, in order to close out the passage with something that says, therefore, while in principle there might be grounds for holding that advertising is detrimental to society, we would have to have the author giving us evidence that advertising may in fact be detrimental to society, and she does just that in her penultimate sentence. I'm in line 49. It's no doubt that in many, perhaps even most cases, the product use doesn't give the emotional dividend that advertisements seem to promise. So it really may be true that advertising is bad, but it's not bad in the way the Marcusians think it is. It's not that we are automatons. We have autonomy. Um, so while in principle there might be grounds for holding this detrimental, the Marcusian critique does not provide such grounds. It might be bad, but not the way Marcuse says. And that brings this third passage to a close.